Welcome to the Massage Hodge podcast. My name is Nick Paterka, a licensed massage therapist in Portland, Oregon. I am joined today by Laura Allen, a massage therapist, an educator, a consultant. She's the president of sales and marketing at ACH Ventures, the parent company to Bioderm. She's the author of many books, including a plain and simple guide to therapeutic massage and bodywork examinations. One year to a successful massage therapy practice, which I currently hold in my <laughs> hand. And uh, very interesting, she has taken on the torch of the educated heart by Nina McIntosh. She released a fourth and fifth edition, but wait, there's more. She also writes the ethics column, Heart of Body Work, which appears in Massage and Body Work magazine. She is a 2011 inductee to the Massage Therapy Hall of Fame. Who even knew there was such a thing? And on top of it all, she's a singer songwriter, having made numerous appearances in public and on public radio and public television. Laura Allen, wow. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's incredible. I, I like this project that you're doing. Thank you so much. So you're here to represent your home state of North Carolina. Now, yes, I am. before you arrived at that very storied list of accomplishments, there was a time when you weren't a massage therapist. So if you could give me a little rewind and talk about why you became a massage therapist to begin with, your origin story, as it were, I would love to hear it. Well, I received my first massage probably about 30 years ago when I woke up one morning and I could not turn my head. So what do you do when you're in trouble? You call your mother. So, uh, <laughs> so I called my mother and I went, oh, I can't turn my head. And she said, don't panic. I'll come and take you to get a massage. So my enlightened mother was getting massaged back then. I had never had one. And um, as it ended up, the she, my mom came to get me. I couldn't even turn my head to see how to drive. And uh, she took me to a massage therapist who was actually the first therapist between Asheville and Charlotte, North Carolina, which is a difference of about 100 miles. And ultimately, that lady ended up owning the massage school that I ultimately ended up attending. So I was a chef tail and a restaurant owner for more than 20 years. I missed that part. I, I read, read about it. You even have a cookbook. Well, that I do have a cookbook. That was my that was my first life. And um, the owner of the massage school used to eat in my cafe all the time. And I had told my, uh, I actually had owned four restaurants over this 20 year period. And I told my partner whenever we opened that last one, before we opened it, I said, I said, this is my last rodeo. I said, you better be ready to buy me out in five years or I'll just lock the door and walk out, you know, whichever <laughs> one you want. So um, the, I started reminding her on year number four that, that I was seriously getting out. And she said, she said, what are you going to do? I said, I, I don't know, but it will not involve standing on my feet a hundred hours a week anymore. So the owner of the massage school used to eat in there all the time. And strangely, her uh, school was located only about two miles away from my house. Ah. And if I won the lottery tomorrow, I would still have a job. I'm not going to just sit around, you know, so, uh, the day that I had made the deal to sell out, she was in there eating lunch and, and I just walked out there and told her that I had sold, uh, sold out. And I said, I said, how about giving me a job? I said, I can type or file or sweep the floor. I, I really didn't care if it was some mindless job. I just wanted something to occupy my time. So she looked at me and she said, are you serious? Uh, she said, I actually am looking for an administrator for my massage school. And then she said, but where am I going to eat? So I told her the big <laughs> fat lie that I would cook for her if she gave me a job. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up going to work there. And, you know, with, within two days of sitting there at the desk and seeing people come in looking like they were in pain and stressed and everything. And then an hour later, seeing them walk out looking so much better. I, I thought this really has to be a great job. So um, she actually had a weekend program for people who worked. So about the third day I was out there, I signed up for that. And um, then like a crazy person, I decided I would also go back to college uh, and finish my college career that I interrupted right after I was out of 
out of high school. Wow. And um, and I was playing in a band. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was just having a crazy time. But um, I ended up being the uh, working there for five years. I actually taught ethics and marketing to my own class in massage school. That would not be allowed nowadays, but the board hadn't yet been formed whenever okay. we started this. So uh, it was a great career change for me. I, I still do a little bit of massage, even though I am working for Cryoderm now. I have about eight private clients that I still see about once a month, and I like to keep my hand in. So, yeah, of course, I'm not seeing them right now in the midst of, of, midst of this current situation. Yeah. Wow. That is... That's quite a story. I can't, I can't, I've, I've meant to include the restaurant in the, in the <laughs> intro. That's fine. You know, I've, I've counted up one time. I conservatively uh, figured out that in my lifetime of cooking for the public, I had cooked more than 875,000 meals. Wow. So whenever I sold out for the next year, I paid my mother to cook at my house <laughs> and, like, and she, didn't, she didn't want any, she didn't want any money for it. Uh, <laughs> but I told her, I said, well, I, I'm not going to do it. I said, you have to name a price. And I said, you can cook dinner for us five nights a week and we'll go out on the weekend. So I was so burned out by that time. I wouldn't have boiled a pot of water if somebody had offered me a hundred dollars. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. It was okay, fine though. So uh, wow, that's quite an origin. The um, so to the to the to the main event of this interview, please share with us what it takes to become a licensed professional in massage in the state of North Carolina. Well, North Carolina is one of I think there are still twenty six states that only require five hundred hour education. Okay, and North Carolina is one of those. Okay. And then it's, are they on with the MBLEX? We are on with the MBLEX. Um, I've served on our state board for five years. And uh, let's see, I believe I was on that board when the MBLEX was adopted. Oh, yeah. And prior to that, you know, I actually got licensed by taking the old mm -hmm. national certification exam, which of course does not really exist anymore mm. um, as a licensing exam. I believe there are still a few states that will accept that. Uh, if you if you still have it, but I, I'm not sure. Maybe that's gone away by now. Yeah. <laughs> They're offering board certification now, but it used to be that most of the states use the national cert for licensing purposes before the MLEX came along. So 500 hours, and then just apply through your state or take the MLEX. You take the MLEX. We require fingerprinting in North Carolina. We require um, I forget how many it is. I want to say three letters of reference from licensed uh, professionals doesn't have to be a license another licensed massage therapist it could be a doctor or a nurse or you know anyone who has a who has is licensed in some what way. about maintaining your license uh, in terms 24 of hours of continuing education every okay. two years and normally normally 12 hours of that is allowed to be done online but during this situation, our board has ruled that for this licensing period that we can do all 24 hours online. Okay. That makes a good amount of sense. Yeah, we don't, I, I've actually, you know, I teach a lot of classes myself and um, I have actually canceled my own classes for the remainder of the year. We oh, don't wow. know how long this is going to last. And uh, I did not want, you know, I didn't want to collect a bunch of money from people and then have to go through the hassle of doing refunds and all of that. Yeah. Um, and if, if things are more calm in the fall, I may reschedule some of what I canceled for this year. But for now, I've canceled everything. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts? I've been asking some people about this, and I think you might be more well positioned given your experience on your board there. Is there any viability to a national standard when it comes to our profession? Well, there's never going to be one. <laughs> Ever, okay, never going to happen. That's the, that's the short answer, but I, I do want to just expound on that for a minute. You know, the there's no common agreed upon language legally, and there have been some very noble attempts 
Um, don't know if you remember the massage therapy body of knowledge or not, but that was a project that started up. It's probably been a decade ago now. And that was a collaborative effort from the massage organizations. And they um, tried to define the terminology related to massage therapy. They put that out there for public comment. And it was disseminated through all of the magazines, Massage Magazine and Massage and Body Work and all of that. Mm -hmm. It was publicized on all of the organizational websites. And they, you know, tried to collect comments on it. Of the thousands, you know, probably 300,000 at the time, massage therapists in the country, they only got 600 comments Mm. And about a hundred of those came from me and another hundred came from Sandy Fritz and the rest were just here, there and yonder. Then when it was put out there, it got criticized all over the place. And my attitude was the same thing it is with voting. If you don't vote, don't complain. And so yeah. I thought, well, if you didn't, you had ample opportunity to give input into this. So that kind of went away. I don't even think that that website stayed up for years, but I don't think it exists anymore. Um, then the ELAP project, which was the um, the entry level massage product uh, project, that was uh, officially started by ABMP. Bob Benson, the founder of ABMP, had this idea, and he asked Dan Williams, their director of education, to. Um, to write down everything that a person graduating from a 650 hour program should know. Mm -hmm. And it ended up uh, being another collaboration between the, all the massage organizations is very thorough blueprint uh, to go by. And of course it's not a legally binding document, but it's a, a great body of suggestions of here's what you should know with entry level school. And so I personally use that as a blueprint whenever I was revising all my textbooks. And a lot of schools are using it as a blueprint, even though they're not legally bound to. A lot of schools have more or less adopted that as a framework for their curriculum. Um, but there's no legal standard, you know, and as long as, as long as, like I said, maybe 25, 26 states still only require 500 hours, there are a lot of other states with more hours up to. 1,000, 1,100 so hours, the states that have higher standards, they're never going to dumb it down for the rest, right. you know, and a lot of the smaller uh, in the states where there are um, only the 500 hours, a lot of the the school owners do not want to go up on that. They say that they can't afford to go up on that, that it would put them out of business and and they're happy with doing, you know, just what the state requires. And yeah. I don't really want that to change. So I, I don't see that happening in my yeah. lifetime. I guess it's just wishful thinking. I, I, I just like the idea of being able to kind of move between states more freely or take trips and practice. And Well, the Federation of State Massage Therapy Boards, which I was a delegate to a couple of times while I was serving on our board, um, created a few years ago, they created what they refer to as the Model Practice Act. And it was a practice act that they wrote that would, you know, have been basically a one size fits all for the states. Um, the last I knew, none of the states have adopted it. You know, every state that already has licensing already had some type of practice act in effect. And there were, there's only a handful of states that don't have licensing now. And so that would, certainly keep any state that licensure is just coming into from having to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. They've got a model practice act right there, but across the board, there's so much variance and so much freedom and from each state, you know, it would require a legislative change in yeah. each and every state to get everybody on the same mm -hmm. wavelength. So I just well, don't, I just don't believe that'll happen, even though it, it would certainly facilitate going across state lines and that kind of thing. And on a certain level, it would elevate the entire profession. It would, but you yeah. know something? I mean, even a doctor, if a doctor leaves North Carolina and goes to South Carolina, they can't practice there without getting yeah, that's a South a good Carolina point. license. Yeah, so, a you know, even though um, it, it, there's, there's not true reciprocity, it does make it easier 
especially moving amongst these 500 hour states, it's, it's has made it a little bit easier to, you know, to get a license. But as far as true reciprocity, where we're going to give you a license here just because you have one there, that doesn't really exist. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. Okay. So Man, I guess I, after your answer, I can just stop asking people about that. That was very <laughs> thorough. <laughs> you know, something, the politics of massage has always fascinated me. I actually blogged about it for about eight years. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, first blogger on Massage Magazine's website. And uh, when I first started blogging, I was just, you know, talking about ethics and marketing and this and that. And then somebody asked me to write a about a political issue in the in the massage profession and I realized that nobody was really doing that so mm-hmm. I've read about 300 blogs on the politics of massage but I don't do that anymore it was just too time consuming uh I, I never you know I spent probably 20 hours some weeks getting a blog together with all the facts so I, I just don't do that anymore <laughs> yeah uh, okay, so we're going to transition now into the state of the world. Could you talk to us about North Carolina and what what happened there as a result of the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis? Well, um, as of uh, today, we've got 7,600 uh, confirmed cases in North Carolina. Um, there's um, 253 deaths, I believe it was, when I looked this morning. Now, North Carolina has got 100 counties. My county, Rutherford County, is actually the largest area-wise of the 100 counties, but it's a very rural county Mm. uh, with a a few little small towns. We have a very disproportionately high number of cases for our population. Hmm. The population in my county is is over 67,000 people We've got 92 confirmed cases, and that's actually, the, I believe, we're the fifth highest in the state. Hmm. Uh, Mecklenburg County, which is Charlotte, a big town and that kind of thing, they've got over 1,000. But um, in proportion to the population, we have, a, we have a relatively, you know, larger number of people um, infected here, and we have had a huge lack of testing. There wasn't a test available here at all until about three weeks ago. Mm. And um, so and did only your, I, I th- go did ahead. your state shut down at the state level or is it county? Our, our state shut down at the state level. Um, I, I'm not ashamed to say that uh, I actually stopped before the governor shut it down and mm. I passed around a petition on one of these change.orgs and something like 350 massage therapists signed it wanting it shut down because mm-hmm. we did not believe it was safe to carry on. And so uh, the governor announced on the 23rd of March that it would shut down on the 25th uh, for 30 days. And he left it open to revise that in the future. So he did just revise that yesterday. He is following, um, he's following the, national the federal government advice of reopening in phases phase one two three and four and so massage therapists are not included in that first phase soft opening more or less and it's a good thing because here in north carolina our our death numbers and infected numbers are still going up every day right how did how are you reacting to the news out of georgia well uh, not only Georgia, but also South Carolina and Tennessee. So oh. I'm going, okay, here I sit in North Carolina, surrounded by three states that are ready for a free-for-all. <laughs> oh, and, I uh, didn't realize that about the other two. Well, yes, Tennessee and South Carolina uh, also have opened it up. And I believe in South Carolina, I think their therapists actually get to start back today, I believe, was the date. That yeah, they today's gave. Georgia's as well, if, if so. Yeah. I know a lot of people who, um, you know, have been chomping at the bit to go back to work. Mm-hmm. And I know many like myself who still don't believe it's a safe thing. Now, uh, I expect it's probably going to be the 1st of June before um, before our governor opens up the, um, the massage. Mm-hmm. But I plan to wait personally a month after that date because... Um, I, I believe there's going to be a resurgence of this. Okay. 
I'm like President Trump. That's just my hunch. <laughs> but, you know, that's actually, I've been self-quarantined now. My husband and I have stayed at home except for absolute necessary trips to the store and that kind of thing uh, since March the 14th. And we I have you had to start cooking again. Well, I have. I've cooked every night. <laughs> um, I've cooked 7,000 meals in the past month. Um, we have we have been out to the grocery store, you know, with our gloves and our mask on and all yep. that kind of stuff. And I, I see so many people that, you know, are bringing their whole families to the store like it was mm-hmm. a social occasion. No masks, no gloves, no no concern about social distancing. And um, we've had protesters here, you know, at the oh, state yeah. capitol and in a lot of other places um, just saying, open it up, open it up. So I think there I think there will be a second wave. And and I plan to stay home for that. Mm. I have some elderly clients that I certainly would not want to endanger. My mother is currently in the hospital right now, and they actually tested her for COVID whenever she was admitted to the hospital. She's been in there uh, since Wednesday or Tuesday. She's been in the hospital since Tuesday. Mm-hmm. I have not been allowed in the hospital. No family members are allowed in or anything. And you know the results of that it. test? Uh, well, her test her test came out negative. Okay. Uh, and I'm glad, but because shortness of breath was actually the symptom that she was exhibiting whenever I took her. Uh, I had. Um, she had called her cardiologist and he advised her to go to the emergency room. So whenever we got there, we were greeted at the door by hospital personnel and they said, you can't come in. And I said, well, I really didn't want to come in. Uh, But I said, can she be tested for the coronavirus? And um, the person said, well, that's the doctor's call. Well, then later when the emergency room doctor called me, I asked about the test. And she said, well, we don't really test unless they have symptoms. And I said, shortness of breath is a symptom. That's why she's here. You know, my mother's 81 years old. And I thought, well, maybe they just don't want to waste a test on an elderly person. Uh, But they ended up doing that. And as as it turns out, thank God, she she was negative. But they are not allowing any visitors into the hospitals here. Yeah, but Um, I could see how it's just scary to even just be at the hospital. Certainly it yeah. is. And, and they had actually put my, they had a unit for coronavirus. They had a floor for coronavirus. Uh, and my mother is still on that floor. And I, I spoke to her this morning and I said, well, mama, aren't they going to move you out from there? And she said, well, she was the very last room at the end of the hall. Uh, and she said, I, I feel okay here that the personnel had on, you know, hazmat suits, I guess, whenever they come in. Oh, wow. Uh, she said everybody was wrapped up tight with, you know, with protective, protective equipment. So, well, I, I certainly hope that, that she's uh, improving every day. And thank you. Be thinking about that. So, what have you been doing with yourself at home besides revisiting your cookbook? Well, uh, I have, I have, I've spent actually the past year revising, um, revising books. Mm. Lippincott a couple of years ago decided that they had they had been my publisher for more than 15 years and they decided they were going to get out of the massage business oh so um I have been revising all of my textbooks some of them were in their second and third edition and that kind of thing and um so I've been revising books I'm down to the last one which is um uh, does that mean you need a new publisher or are you going to? No, I actually, I actually had self published a lot of other books oh. on. Uh, so I decided I would go with that. I didn't even shop them around to another, to another publisher because, you know, if something comes along and happens like the situation that happened with Liffincott, um, you know, they gave me my copyrights back and they, they've given them back to most of their massage authors, but, I have friends that, you know, two years after the fact, they still haven't received their copyrights. No. And uh, so I, I kind of like being in charge of my own thing. I actually did end up hiring the same uh, compositor company that, you know, has always put the books together oh. as far as, you know, placing the images and designing the designing the book and that kind of thing. I hired the same one that Lippincott had always used. And so it's been continuity. I've worked with those folks for years and, 
um, and they've done a really good job on my books. So, but but new, ultimately, when they whenever they finish their job, they send that to me, and then I'm I'm self publishing them. New all. editions uh, of some of your works are maybe coming soon. Well, in within the past year, now the the one that you held up one year to a successful massage therapy practice. That is the new edition, and I was just real thrilled at all of the the folks in massage therapy that contributed to that book because uh, I got about 50 of the most well-known and, and best therapists in the country that made contributions to that book. I have no so, doubt that this is going to help me tremendously. I only started my private practice in January, but I actually need to open your book and do the work. <laughs> well, you know something I'm I'm we'll going to be teaching a, I'm going to be teaching a webinar in May. Uh, Michael Buck, Monk King Michael Buck down in Florida asked me to participate in this. And, I, and I'm going to speak on that subject because so many people have had to shut down their business during this. They're going to be what amounts to virtually starting over. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I know that a, a lot of us, for, for example, I, I don't solicit clients. I have all of the clients that I want at this stage in my life and my having another job and all of that. But, um, you know, there are a lot of clients out there who are, have found themselves in the same boat that a lot of massage therapists are in, which is that they may be unemployed right now. They may have been furloughed. You know, there I'm sure will be businesses that do not survive this, mm -hmm. um, and small businesses in particular. And so, for a lot of people, they may have to consider, a uh, therapist may have to consider that some of their clients are unemployed and they may not have the discretionary money for their massage. Mm -hmm. Some people view massage as a luxury. Personally, right now, I'd give $1,000 for somebody to work <laughs> on my neck, um, yeah. you know, because I've, I'm spoiled. I've been getting massage for 30 years and, and it has kept me, you know, out of a lot of pain. So I think it will be virtually like starting over for a, a lot of people and having to having to get new business. Yeah, it's interesting. So yeah. So, what do you think this crisis does to our profession? What what's going to look different coming out? Well, I think we're going to have to have a new normal. Okay. And one of the best things I've seen is you know you can read this on Ruth Warner's website I'm sure and also on ABMP's website abmp.com or ruthwarner.com um, Ruth and Diana Thompson who uh, uh, Ruth of course is the author of the pathology, pathology Bible uh, yes and Diana Thompson is the um, is the author of Hands Heal uh, you know she's a Diana has Diana started doing massage when she was 18. Wow. I, I can't out Diana on how old she is, but I'm going to say she's been doing massage for more than 40 years. Wow. That's been her only job this, her entire life. It's been her only job. Uh, and she is, um, she's in Washington state. And then Melanie Hayden from up in Canada, uh, got together and they made this video and I'm sure it's also on YouTube. And it oh, is, I, that was recent, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did touch some of that. Yes, that was just a, and I'm sure the link to it's on ABMP's website. That was just a, a few days ago when they uh, had a, they recorded a, a big discussion over how this needs to look. Now, you know, for years, um, I, I have always said that I would never tell anybody they could eat off the floor at my house, but <laughs> I've always said you could eat off the floor at my office. And, um, so I think it's to the point now there, especially in places, I'm not going to call any names, but you know, in places where people are not given adequate time in between clients and oh, just, I, I, I'm not afraid. Well, you go right <laughs> in any big corporation, I, you know, any big corporation yeah. where, where there's not adequate time for, there has not been an adequate time for an adequate intake. There's not time for adequate sanitation in between clients we're all going to have to modify the way we do things. I'm, I'm working on a new intake form for myself right now. Uh, and I've seen some out there on the internet that are specific to this situation with the questions that you would ask about, have you been around any infected people? Mm. Have you been sick yourself? Have you been here or there, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, the days that we can change the sheets 
and see the next client are over. <laughs> you know, yeah. just plain over. We're going to have to be very careful for, I, I believe, for a long, long time. And I, I just think everybody should adopt the new way of doing things, which is ultra sanitation, mm -hmm. sanitation on overdrive. We're going to have to. Um, yeah. You know, we're going to have to be careful about um, doing a careful intake with clients. And and, We've had longer, a, and like at least 30 minute transitions. Do you think that's I, I'm longer? going to say I, I would say at least 30 minutes. And, yeah. um, you know, it's going to it's going to I saw somebody the other day and they went, well, I'm ready to rock. I'm going to be seeing eight clients a day, seven days a week. And, you know, I, I thought, well, I believe the most that I ever did. And, you know, I was I was 40 or something when I started doing massage. I think the most that I ever did was was eight or nine in a day. And that was when a coworker got sick and I took over a few of her a few of her clients instead of canceling them. I'm 60 years old. There's no way in the world I'm going to do um, eight people in a day. And. You know, we're going to have to change the way that we work. We are going to have to leave more time for intakes, more time for sanitation, um, and, and just be ultra careful. Yeah. You know, I've always I've seen people saying, well, I, I wipe down, I wipe the face, rest, and do this and that. And I thought, I, I've been doing that since day one of my career. Right. But we're going to have to, we're going to have to step it up now. I mean due to the fact that this this heinous you know disease has um asymptomatic people that can be carriers we just have to be more careful because somebody can come in there and and look as healthy as me or you look sitting right here right now mm -hmm. and, and be a carrier and they don't know it and we don't know it so right. um i i don't mean to instill paranoia but i do think we're going to have to treat this as a whole different ball game when we get started back. Yeah, for sure. What about the, what about the clinical side? What do you feel like, what would you say we therapists are likely to see in bodies when we get back? How, how is this affecting people, this being at home, this touch deprivation? What are we going to see? Well, you know, something touch deprivation is a real thing. And, and I can vouch for that. I was, I was widowed before I uh, married my, my husband that I married last July and um, my previous husband that I was with for 25 years, he actually was also a licensed massage therapist. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, something touch deprivation is a, is a real thing. And so I think the therapist uh, who are used to working every day, you know, they're suffering from it as much as their clients are. And I yeah. see people say that all the time on my, on my social media. Um, but I also have seen some of the guidelines, you know, recommended. I actually am the administrator of the North Carolina Massage Therapist Group that's on Facebook. And we have a huge thread going on there, a pinned thread about um, protocols for when we're able to start back. And mm -hmm. people keep throwing out more and more ideas on there of, um, you know, of the client wearing mask, us wearing mask, avoid working on people's faces. I saw Angie Patrick from Massage Warehouse. Uh, she's worked for them for years. She put it out there the other day and said, what is it you need sanitation wise? You know, what is it we can start obtaining or manufacturing that will make everyone feel better in this situation? And so, People were asking for table warmers that could be wiped off, uh, mm. you know, and which is not usually the case. Right. Uh, but they were they were asking for um, different lighter weight blankets, for example, that, you know, you need to you've always needed to change blankets between every client. I've known a lot of therapy. Right. But like conversations I've had on this show. Yeah. I think there's been a lot of lax feelings about that. There you know, truly has blankets being there washed once a week and yeah, that kind of thing. There truly has. And, uh, you know, something, I mean, is sort of like going into a hotel and wondering if they changed the comforter on the bed. <laughs> you know? We don't want to, we want to, we have to instill confidence in people 
that we are being very careful yeah. with them. And so, um, like I said, I'm just personally not going to start back until until a month after whenever they say we can. And depending yeah. on how that goes. And maybe, well, do you think you'll be wearing a mask personally or asking clients to? I, I do think that I will. I do yeah. think that I will. And this is going to cut out my personal specialty. I love to work with TMJ dysfunction. Mm. And um, now that for the past few years that I've been working on the corporate side of things, prior to that, I had a clinic for 13 years. I I had a bunch of massage therapists. I employed a chiropractor and a naturopath, acupuncturist, and an esthetician, and uh, you know some alternative practitioners. And um, we just had a we had a big old thing going. Well, my dentist, I persuaded my dentist when I was still in massage school and I learned TMJ massage. I persuaded my dentist to come and and get a session. And uh, he referred people to me until the day I closed that big practice. Oh, wow. I, I've stayed open for 13 years. So I'm not comfortable right now putting my gloved hands inside people's mouth. Right. Um, you know, some of the things that we've been warned about, I've seen people warning, you know, don't work on the face, don't don't even work on the neck, don't get near the face, and and, and don't work on hands, you know. Man, it, it, there's gonna there's a lot of advice out there and everyone's just going to have to read through that and based on the type of work that they do you know i know practitioners who for example are doing time massage where people don't have to get undressed and mm -hmm. um ashiatsu where they're working with feet and that kind of thing there's so many different things out there that everybody's going sure. to have to modify what they do you know, for themselves and for the safety of, for the safety of their safety and for the safety of the client. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely new, new things uh, coming to our profession for sure. So yeah. since I, before I let you go, but since I have you here, w would you say something about the educated heart and, and your, your experience with Nina McIntosh and taking over that, that book? I know she's a, she's a personal friend of yours and I, and that was a book that was used in my school, and I think it's it's used around the country to this day and all the, the new editions that you've put out. And I would just love to hear you talk about her and your experience taking over that, that great well, book. Well, it was, um, it was a, a delight to me. I met Nina. Um, I had already had several books published by Lippincott, and every year at the AMTA National Convention, Lippincott used to get all of their massage authors together for a uh, for a big dinner. Mm. And so it happened one year that I was seated next to Nina and we struck up a conversation. Nina was from Colorado, but, uh, well, actually she was from Tennessee, but she had been living in Colorado for many years and she had moved to Asheville, North Carolina, which is about 45 minutes away from me. Okay. So while we were sitting there chatting and we found out that we lived close together we struck up a friendship. I attended, Nina used to teach classes at uh, uh, Mayhek, which is a, an education facility associated with the hospitals up in Asheville. So I attended a couple of her classes there, and then I, I had her down to my facility. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I had her down to my facility to mm -hmm. teach a couple of classes, and Nina passed from Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm -hmm. And I, in retrospect, believe she probably had it for two or three years before she got diagnosed because one time when she was coming down to teach class, she called me up and said, um, she asked me if I had a microphone. And I said, well, yeah, man, I'm a musician. I got microphones. I said, <laughs> but, my, but my classroom is small. I don't think you're going to need it. And she said, uh, she said, well, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just can't speak loud lately. And then that night after class, we went out to dinner. And when we got out of the car, she she asked my husband if she could hang on to him while we were walking to the mm -hmm. restaurant. She said, my legs just don't want to work, you know. And so in retrospect, there were some clues that she had it. And that's, a, you know, that's a disease that sometimes takes a while to diagnose. But um, Nina carried on, you know, she was working on that third edition of The mm -hmm. Educated Heart when she really started to decline mm -hmm. 
And that was a big, big deal to her that she finished that book. There are, uh, in the ancillaries of that book, there are some great videos. Uh, there are some now that I wrote the scripts for, but I, I, I said whenever I took that book over, I'm like, I'm not getting rid of Nina's videos because they're priceless. Mm. They're open-ended ethical dilemmas where some little scenario comes on and at the end of it, it's, it's just an abrupt ending and you have to decide how would you handle that particular situation. So yeah, uh, I left, I've left Nina's videos intact and I, I left a lot of the book intact. It was never my intention. That was a great book. It yeah. was also used in massage school. That was our ethics book when I went to massage school. Amazing. So um, I have definitely kept the spirit of her book and, uh, I think she would, uh, I hope that she would be pleased with what I've done with it. Nina hated the internet and uh, <laughs> I had to persuade her. She did get on Caring Bridge, which is a, a website for people who are terminally ill or, mm -hmm. or facing a life threatening illness. She did get on Caring Bridge finally about the last year there so that she could just update people at once, you know, with her mm -hmm. condition. But, she got on Facebook one time and oh God, she just hated it. You know, and she's like, no, this is not for me. So what do you think? Um, it, what do you think it is about the educated heart that continues to resonate with people so much? Well, I think it, it I think it's just all uh, the roles and boundaries, you know, something, I mean, a lot of ethics courses focus on the boundaries of the client. Mm. And of course we have to honor those. Certainly. But Nina had a big focus on the boundaries of the therapist mm. and how that, you know, how maintaining your good boundaries was directly related to your mental health, <laughs> uh, your attitude with your work, your enjoyment of your work and your finances. And she was a very big believer that we needed to maintain our own boundaries in order to be um, successful in massage therapy. So I've always enjoyed that about the book. And, you know, I, I did do some expanding on it just because like I said a moment ago, Nina hated the internet, you know, the internet kind of exploded with social media and everything a few years back. And there was hardly anything in the book about that. Mm. So I really beefed up that in the book because, you know, the internet is the ethical disaster of the free world. <laughs> uh, and especially, especially uh, social media, we have to be very careful, you know, not to talk about clients and, and stuff on the internet. And, and even uh, the ways we're connected to our clients, potentially, like, do you, your clients may be following your, your profiles yeah. and do you follow your clients? Do you, do you accept friend requests? Yeah. There's so many things like there's that. There's so much, there's so much. So i ended up, you know, in the past two editions, which I did author, I ended up putting a lot in there about, uh, about the internet and the boundaries that we need to have on there for the client and for ourselves. But yeah. that is what I really appreciated about Nina, her different uh, approach there of, Yes, we're going to definitely honor the client boundaries, but we need to have some boundaries too, and we yeah, need to honor those. Sense. Well, when I make it through these 50 states, I wonder if I might invite you back to talk specifically about ethics and boundaries. If Anytime. I would, be, I would absolutely be. love that. That would be incredible. And it's my more about the educated heart and, and everything. So, And maybe, uh, maybe you could share a recipe or two. <laughs> that's my ethics is my pet subject uh, ethics and and research uh and so those are those are two topics that are dear to my heart but ethics yeah. especially especially i take a lot of my own continuing education um in ethics and take things from other instructors because somebody's going to have a perspective that i don't have um, ethics classes in person are always good for, you know, sharing dilemmas and that kind of thing. So I tend to get a lot of my CE hours every time, uh, in other people's yeah. classes. I took a great, uh, ethics course with Sarah B. Davis here at East West College and it, with a group of massage therapists, it's just so interesting to have a, a, a dilemma presented and just to see how everyone comes at it differently. Well, I didn't realize you were from East West, and I oh. did know that they use the educated heart because yeah. they they uh, have been in touch with me several times. So excellent, excellent. Yeah. 
Well, Laura, Alan, this has been absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. Thank I you. Will, uh, had a great time. I will include everything about where people can find you in the show notes. And uh, you and I can chat for a couple more minutes after we stop okay. this recording. But thanks again for being on the Massage Hodge Thank podcast. You. And we will talk uh, again soon. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Okay.